exploring the intersection of resilient technology, organizations, and people. Redeploy. So hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to the very first ever Redeploy. I can't believe we haven't had a conference like this before. Holy crap, what took us so long? I'm so glad that we have one now. So unlike most of the rest of you, I'm not in ops. I'm not in dev anymore. I'm not really in sysadmin or SRE or anything like that. My entire life now is free and open source software. I'm like VP of OSI and open, I do, um, that's open source initiative, by the way. And I do freelance for open source and I write for open source and I write books about, you know, I do all of that. So normally you wouldn't think that I'll be standing up here talking to you about resilience, but as Mary mentioned, I did used to lead software engineering departments at the director and VP level. And I've been in this industry for over 20 years, so I've been around a lot. Now, when I did lead software engineering teams, I kind of got into the habit for various reasons of studying failure. Why does it happen? What even is failure, really? So I did a lot of research. And my research spanned all sorts of industries, not just software development, but you've got aerospace, and you've got theater, and you've got everything. Things fail everywhere. So what I did is I created a bibliography for it. So this is a Zotero bibliography of all of that research. There's currently over 200 items in here, books, articles, videos, whole nine yards, lots of stuff, over 3,000 pages of research here. I will be saying the phrase, research shows a whole lot during this talk. So if you want to know what that is, here you go. You've got a citation for that. I will show you this URL at the end. Now what this talk does is it synthesizes and condenses down all of those thousands of pages of research into the commonalities, the things that you see over and over again in that research. And there are several common themes. They can be summarized in the categories of factors and fixes. And factors are those things that contribute to failure, and fixes are the things that make it better for you in some way. Now, I will cover each of these common themes during this talk. But like I said, there are thousands of pages. And I've only got 40 minutes, so I can't exactly cover it all. So please don't expect me to. I will only kind of touch upon each of these themes. And speaking of not covering, I am not going to give you a silver bullet. I'm not going to give you some sort of secret serum that is going to suddenly wipe failure out of your life because it doesn't exist. There isn't one of those. What I will give you at the end is a list of questions that you can take back to your team, your company, your department, and say, hey, let's answer these. And the answers to those questions can lead you towards better failures or fewer failures. I am also, again, only an overview, 3,000 pages, not going to get it all. So there is one final limitation of this talk that I want to give you. Most of that research is psychological in nature, one way or another. These aren't the technical reasons for failure. These are the human reasons for failure. Now, all of the research I've studied, it was done under European psychology on predominantly Western subjects. And unrelated psychological studies have recently finally shown that Western psychology doesn't necessarily apply to people of other cultures, like Eastern or African or you know, anyone who is not in a European-based culture. So most of this stuff should mostly apply, but you should be aware that there is a Western bias to this study. Now, let me get into those common themes, but first, I need a drink. There's not like a, this is fraught with peril. That's what this is. So let's not have a little failure demo up here. All right, let's talk about those things. And we are going to start with complexity. We are going to hit the wrong button. Nope, there we go. Complexity. Now, the world is complex. Surprise. I know, who saw that coming? The world is complex, people are complex, projects are complex. The complexity hiding in something as seemingly simple as a chocolate chip cookie, when you look at it, is actually kind of mind-blowing. Chocolate alone is phenomenal with complexity. Research shows, though, that the human brain, it doesn't like complexity very much. 
and that leads to some unfortunate tendencies. For starters, we humans have a tendency to ignore complexity completely. La, 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 nothing to see here moving along. Everything around us is constantly changing and constantly evolving, but research shows that we prefer to operate as though we are in a static environment. So we will start a project, we will start something, and we'll take a mental snapshot of the world, and then we will operate within this snapshot. This leads to a lot of problems, you can probably imagine, as the rest of the world moves forward and our snapshot does not. Relatedly, research shows that we really dislike variation. We like things to be just so and stay that way, hence the snapshot, because a snapshot doesn't move around. So despite people who say that they're really good at multitasking, the truth is that our brains prefer to work in serial rather than parallel. We prefer to focus on a static now, on our mental snapshot, rather that, than that really foggy, cloudy, nebulous, sort of ever-changing, uncertain future. Our brains don't like that very much. And that uncertain future, it's very unsettling to our brains. We prefer, mentally speaking, to operate as though we know everything. Because again, we've got that snapshot. And this is known territory. But unfortunately, we don't actually know as much as we think we do. Because we think we know more than we really do, we have a tendency, again, lots of tendencies here. There's always outliers. But we have a tendency to not look around for potential and potential, potentially obvious problems. These are those unknowns, unknowns out there. right? And it's not just some silly thing that a politician said once. It's a legitimate psychological concept. And that concept is known as latent errors. These are overlooked near misses. These are things that look an awful lot like successes just because they haven't failed yet. And they haven't failed yet because they haven't met their enabling condition. An enabling condition is something that turns a latent error to the dark side. Right? Now, a real world example that probably a lot of you might be generally familiar with is the Deepwater Horizon tragedy. How many of you remember Deepwater Horizon? OK. So uh, for those of you who don't remember it, Deepwater Horizon was an oil rig tragedy that happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, so not that long ago. Now, what happened in Deepwater Horizon? Obviously, it's complex. But to oversimplify things greatly, we had a man over here. And this man is doing something that you do all the time on oil rigs. He's filling a pipe with cement. You do it all the time. Very common. I don't actually know why, because I'm not an oil sort of scientist person. But he was doing it. But the problem was, he was doing it wrong. And when he was doing it wrong, gas was escaping from the pipe. Usually not a problem. While he was doing it wrong, he was actually doing it the same way they always did it. This is just the way we do things around here. Gas is escaping, but it's OK. So that's this dude over here. Then you've got this dude over here who's welding. And you're all like, oh, yeah, I see what happens here. Well, you actually don't see what happens here, because it's an oil rig, folks. People are constantly welding all the time, often near somebody doing some sort of, uh, of gas-related thing. right? So that's not actually a problem. The problem is that something happened that day that you almost never see in the Gulf of Mexico on the high seas. What happened that day is that it was windless. And that never happens. And because of that, the sparks that usually would have been blown away stuck around, and they sparked the gas. And it triggered an explosion that killed 11 people. And it injured 16 more. And it led to one of the largest environmental disasters our country has ever seen. So what we've got over here is a man doing his cementing procedure. That's a latent error. You have a man doing welding, and that's a latent error. And then you have the windless day. And that is your enabling condition. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. You can do something about latent errors, but you've got to look for them. Postmortems are a great opportunity to look for latent errors. So you get people together and you ask them, hey, so 
What was successful pretty much by chance? What shouldn't have worked but really did? How cool is that? Right? But the problem with all of this is research shows we are horrible at postmortems. We as human beings are complete rubbish at this. We prefer to look for symptoms rather than causes because, again, we don't like complexity. And so we'll take the first thing that comes along that looks like it might be an answer, and that's going to be a symptom. We have a preference for blame and finger pointing. We like to do this. And so therefore, we always look for a root cause, even when one doesn't exist. And most of you in this room are probably aware of the fact that there is almost never a root cause. It's usually, again, a complex thing, and there are multiple causes. But we'll go for a root cause and stop because we like pointing fingers. Apologies if I just pointed a finger at somebody. Um, we also suffer from selection bias. We look at the things we prefer to look at rather than the difficult things. Because of that, we have a tendency to post-mortem non-representative data sets. And part of that non-representative data set problem is that we typically only post-mortem the things that went wrong. This is called negative outcome bias. So if we're only doing postmortems on the failures, then it means we never review those near misses. We never look at the things that went right pretty much by chance, which means we never find the latent errors so we can avoid them in the future. We also ignore the very complex processes that lead to a successful outcome. And this is a problem. It means we're very bad at postmortems. We can get better, though, if we know that we're doing it wrong. So how can we get better at these tendencies against complexity? Well, we can do a pre-mortem. How many of you have heard of or do pre-mortems at all? OK, a few of you. Excellent. You're my favorite people in the room. Don't tell the others. So uh, you can do a pre-mortem. And when you're doing a pre-mortem, among other things, you can look for latent errors. And you can spot them. And you can do something about them before they happen you can set up some sort of uh, risk minimizing mechanism. And when you do a pre-mortem, you can bring in different perspectives. Get in outsiders, people who aren't on your team, people who don't know the way we do things here. And those people are going to be asking a lot of questions that the team otherwise wouldn't think to ask. And they're probably going to spot a lot more latent errors than you do. Now, let's move on to our second theme, common across all of the research, and that is assumptions. So assumptions. Research has nothing nice to say about assumptions. Nearly every single piece of research points to assumptions as a frequent contributor to failure. Why is that? We need assumptions to operate, don't we? How, how can they possibly be bad? Well, for starters, assumptions are typically based on incorrect or invalid information, including those aforementioned mental snapshots of the world that we take. We then use assumptions based on invalid information as a set of heuristics that we apply to the real world. So those heuristics are naturally flawed from the very first moment you do it. An example of this we've all probably dealt with before are estimates. Uh, part of the reason none of us are really good at estimates is because we are using incorrect assumptions that we are create, using heuristics on and giving really bad estimates. We're also doing a big CYA, but that's a different sort of thing. But our assumptions are also wrong because we do a really bad job of defining what the problem is to begin with. Research shows time and time again, we as human beings, we don't want to define the problem. We want to jump to the solution. Because that's where the fun stuff is, right? But if you don't define the problem, then you will be working with assumptions that are based on an assumption, because you are assuming the problem. And then it's assumptions all the way down. Assumptions based on assumptions are even less reliable than the original assumptions, which were already not reliable. But we use them anyway, because that's the way we operate. Now, we in technology love saying the phrase, fail fast, right? But we're really bad at it. And a large reason for that is that we don't bother to define the problem up front. Without that, 
we can't know what success looks like. And without knowing what success looks like, you can actually can't tell what failure looks like. You can only guess at it. So if you don't define the problem up front, how can you fail fast? How can you fail at all? Well, what it does is it leads to a lot of failures and even worse, zombies that just failed long ago and never died. Thank you, Avery, for mentioning zombies. It just works right well. Um, so if you def as you're working through these things and you're defining your problem, which obviously you need to do, list its requirements. You know, that's one of the things you need to do as you're defining your problem to get it properly done. But as you're listing those requirements, don't think of them as requirements. Think of them as assumptions. And as assumptions, each and every one of them must be questioned and must be confirmed. And that's because of this. Unquestioned assumptions, research shows time and time again, become facts in the minds of the people who hear them. We have all seen this in action. When you're sitting in a room and you're all talking about the next project that's coming up and someone says, hey, how long is this going to take us? Someone else at the table says, it'll be two weeks, but we have to confirm. Research shows that no one will hear anything after that two weeks. They never hear, but we have to confirm. That two weeks gets cemented in their brain as, oh, well, this is going to take two weeks. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. We all have been bitten by that, I'm sure. We all claim we don't have time to do this. We claim we don't have time to define our problem. We claim we don't have time to verify our assumptions. Because this is the Bay Area, this is software, we have to move fast and break shit. Right? That's what we do here. Well, what we actually do seem to have a lot of time for is to work on the wrong thing for the wrong people and then scrap it and start all over again. We have plenty of time for that. So how can we minimize the impact of these assumptive tendencies? Well, for starters, please define your problem. And as you're doing that, then perform that pre-mortem on it. And along with looking for latent errors, list your assumptions. Ask everyone, what are we assuming? What are we not entirely sure of? What needs to be confirmed? List those, then write them down. Document them in whatever it makes most sense for your project to document them in because you're going to go back to those. You're going to build in checkpoints into your project so you can verify these things because that environment will change. As you start a project, you take that snapshot, build in checkpoints so you can refresh your mental snapshot every once in a while. And then you also go through and you check your assumptions because you have more information now. Because you have more information, some of those assumptions might be truth, they might be fact, you might have converted them into knowledge, but if you don't check, you don't know for sure. So do that. Now onto the final item on our list of factors contributing to failure, and that is humans. Research shows that humans are the leading cause of failure. <laughs> I know, crazy, right? We can't exactly take humans out of the picture, though, but we can do something about our organizations and our cultures, each of which play a very large role in contributing to failure. Research shows that as species go, we are quite arrogant. Um, we have this tendency to overestimate uh, the impact that we can have. Uh, we overestimate the things we can control or even the things that we can just influence. And this is called illusion of control. Now, while illusion of control has been around for as long as there have been humans, it was Ellen Langer, a psychology at Harvard, who first named and pub published about it. So thank you, Dr. Langer. Now, this leads to a lot of bad things, illusion of control. We talked about some of these earlier, Deepwater Horizon. Now, if we think we can control everything, then we feel more confident. And if we feel more confident, then we let our guard down. And we let our guard down. We overlook a lot of latent errors. But if we look for them and find them, we do have the power to control latent errors. So we can control that much. If we happen to have been on Deepwater Horizon that day, we could have looked and said, OK, hey, you should do that right. So please stop your cementing procedure and do it properly, because gas. And you, Mr. Wilder person, maybe you could just wait a little bit for him to be done. We can do this. We can look at these latent errors and do something about them. But what we can never do is make the wind blow. So enabling conditions are 
the things that we have zero chance of ever controlling. We can control latent errors. We cannot control enabling conditions. So at best, we can only ever influence situations. We can never truly control them. Another big contributor to ignoring latent errors is a lack of psychological safety. Now, psychological safety is getting a lot of press lately, thank God. Um, it is a complex matter, but one of its many benefits is that people feel safe pointing out oversights like latent errors. Because if people feel retribution, if they fear punishment, they are very unlikely to call attention to things like latent errors. Because if they do so, it might piss off somebody in power, and they might get fired. So people aren't going to do that. They're not going to do that if they fear, fear, fear they are going to get somehow punished for it. One of the many contributors towards psychological safety is the structure or the organization of your team or group. Um, it can affect the communication routes. It can also affect your group's reaction to failure and its resistance to change or not. Is it organized into silos? Uh, organizational silos, who has heard that term before? Great, excellent. Um, so organizational silos, um, essentially you've got team A, team B, team C, and they're all working on their stuff and they're chugging along just greatly, but they're just working within their teams. There's no sharing, there's no communication, and that's one of the big problems with organizational silos is that it hampers communication and it obscures information. So when team C has a failure in some sort of technology that they're using, if team A is using that exact same technology, because of the silos, that information is not being shared. And so we have just propagated and amplified one error by not allowing team A to learn about it and prevent it. So that's a big problem with silos. They keep us from sharing information. How about processes? Is your department, is your team, is your company organized around processes? Like these people design and those people develop and those other folks test and then that group deploys and those ones over there are doing support. This is really common and I want you to know that there's nothing necessarily wrong with this, this organization, this structure for your team. So don't freak out if you're like, oh my God, that's my department. Don't freak out. It's okay. This is relatively common. But what if the process is the thing that's contributing to the failures? What happens when you have to change that process? What research finds is that if that at all requires some sort of reorganization, we're not going to change the process because it's a lot of work to reorg a group. Um, so we don't change the process. Failure continues happening. It's terrible. When failure does happen, regardless of how your team is structured, those two structures, something else, project teams, doesn't matter. When failure happens, how does your group react to it? How does your company? Does it punish people? Does it punish them explicitly? Even more insidious, does it punish them implicitly in some way? Won't surprise you to learn that research shows that this is, punishment is the wrong approach. It's because punishing failure makes it worse. How does it do that? It's probably pretty obvious to everyone in this room, but if you punish failure, then failures stop being reported. And you can't learn from mistakes that you don't know about. And really, that's how you minimize, that's how you reduce future failures, by learning from those that have already occurred. In order to do that, though, the failure must be shared. Unshared failures are just the experience of an individual. They are not shared learning, and therefore, they're of low value. I can, have, I can experience this, just standing right here and have redeploy happen to me. But until I take that extra step of thinking about it, learning will never occur. So we must absolutely share information and think about it if we're to learn from it, if we're to actually gain from our failures. And we can't do that if people aren't sharing. And this should be a great big red flag. If you're not hearing about failures in your organization, I guarantee you 100% that it's not that the failures aren't there, it's just that you're not hearing about them. And that's a problem. It means people aren't feeling safe to share. Another great problem with punishment is that it prevents people from trying new things. 
innovation slows down and sometimes stops completely. And I'm not just talking like that Silicon Valley VC innovation type thing. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the innovation that actually matters day to day. And that's the innovation of processes. It's the innovation of streamlining things, of trying new ideas, of picking up a new technology. People will be less likely to do those things that make a legitimate difference to everyone's quality of life. Because what will happen if I fail? I don't know. This is a huge sign of a lack of psychological safety. Not sharing failures, not pointing out latent errors. What this can also do is have them be seen as normal. It's called normalized deviance. And it was identified and labeled by Diane Vaughn. Diane Vaughn, who wrote this amazing book of the space shuttle Challenger explosion. She is an American psychologist. Now, normalized deviance is an, a latent error lying right out in the open and intentionally ignored. And normalized deviance that we all can probably relate to. Say you are a new dev on a team. Just joined the team, really excited to get started. You start tailing logs because you just want to you know, see how things are working under the hood. And oh my gosh, there's this error that keeps popping up over and over again. I found a problem. I just started. How exciting is that? So you run to your senior developer and you're like, senior developer, senior developer, I found an error. It's in the logs. And they say, oh, that. Yeah, we just ignore that. What you've just come across is a normalized deviance. Now, setting aside the fact that if it is an error, you should probably fix it because you are one race condition away from a catastrophe. You know, if that, and if it's not an error, then why is it ruining your signal to noise ratio in your logs? You know, setting that aside, this is normalized deviance and it's a big problem. It's a latent error lying right out in the open. We are all also probably familiar with another way that culture contributes to failure. This is not just in software development, and I'm very glad we're finally starting to talk about this openly here in software dev. But we as humans, we have an unfortunate tendency to push ourselves too hard, to try doing too much in too little time, to put in long hours, usually unnecessarily, when it's not going to help anything. This leads to a lot of problems. We have attention slips. We have more reliance on untested assumptions. We sometimes just make stuff up so we can continue going along because we're so tired. Some of the best research on this particular subject of fatigue-driven errors and failures, it's in hospitals. And because of that research, lives have literally been saved just by allowing people to go to sleep. Studies show that we as human beings don't like to stop things. We have a sunk cost fallacy. I've started this. I'm going to see it through to the end, no matter what. Um, this is related to that earlier finding that our brains prefer to work in serial rather than parallel. Right? We just want to continue going. This leads to zombie projects. Those are those shambling along that are just consuming your team's brain. Right? They're, just, they're dead, but you can't kill them. These also happen. We also have problem pulling plug on things because we don't know what done looks like, because we haven't defined what our problem is. You can't tell whether you're still on the right path towards your destination if you don't even know what your destination is to begin with, so you don't know whether you've veered off into La La Land. No, there are bullet points here. Project champions are also a problem with the uh, sunk cost fallacy, the inability to kill off projects. And those are the people who have this like reality distortion field around them. And they'd be waving the flag, yay, go team, this is amazing, we're doing a great thing here with this project, awesome. In the meantime, everyone is buying their bullshit, going, yes, we can do this, we can do this. And they're not looking at the evidence. And every single piece of evidence is showing that, no, this isn't working. This is failing. But this happens all the time, because we like to feel belonging. Research also shows that we don't pull the plug on things because we don't know how. We haven't been trained in the appropriate communication skills to deliver this news in an empathetic and useful way. We don't want to hurt people by pulling the plug on their project. But why would that hurt people? Aside from the ego, why would it possibly hurt people to pull the plug on their project? 
because they don't know what's going to happen to them. There is no exit plan for your project, no way to unwind it, no way to tell that person it's OK if we kill projects, because then this happens to you. And the this I mentioned is not you getting laid off and you losing your house and your health insurance and your kids not being able to go to school. No, no, no. So giving people the psychological safety by letting them know up front, it's OK if we pull the plug, because you will be safe. Having an exit plan is very useful for this. And it helps, it make, helps make it a lot easier to communicate that we're going to pull the plug on your project. So what do we do all about all these things? Organizational changes, research shows over and over again, they're very difficult to start and even harder to finish. But if you can do it, they are worthwhile. First of all, you're going to get sick of hearing me say this, but I'm not done yet. Research shows that if you do not have support from the top for any sort of organizational change, your project for change is going to fail. Yeah, there's going to be outliers and once in a while they'll work, but in general, they're going to fail if you don't have support from the top. Part of that support for the top is going to be your leaders sharing their failures and what they learn from them. And this shows everyone that it's OK to share failures. I'm not going to be punished for it, because my CEO, she's telling me about her failures. Another suggestion, develop that culture of psychological safety. Um, I have only two slides on what really is an entire book worth of stuff, if not a series of books. So no, I'm not going to go into details about how you develop a, a culture of psychological safety. But you do have to remember that that experience is automatic. Learning, learning is not, right? Through words, through deeds, encourage people to share their mistakes and failures. Because then the entire group, the entire culture can start learning. And learning is amazing because learning develops intuition and it develops skills. So how many of you out there identify as some senior member of technical staff of some variety? Okay, about half or so. Now, I can guarantee you that you people didn't get to be senior because of your age. You got to be senior because you've seen some shit, man. Right? You have experienced failure, and you have learned from it. Because of that, you've developed intuition and skill that teaches you what doesn't work so in the future, you can spot failure before it happens. That's why you're senior. But you can't do any of that if mistakes and failures are hidden due to an intolerant environment. Now, studies show that psychologically safe environments, this is a relatively new uh, study. I was really excited when this came across the wires. Psychologically safe environments, they are the most productive, the most innovative, the most cost effective, and the most profitable. So if you're not going to do it because it's right, at least do it because it lines your pockets. So working to provide that psychological safety it helps reduce failure, among many other wonderful things. As you do your pre-mortems, as you do your post-mortems, I've mentioned this before, try to get outsiders in there. Try to take a more multidisciplinary approach to them. Because those outsiders are going to be spotting your bullshit and calling you on it. And because you've created a psychologically safe environment, it's OK for them to do that. Because you see the benefit and them saying, oh, there's a problem right there, or can you explain why you do that? And if the answer is, because we've always done it that way, that ought to be a great big red flag, because that's one of the most dangerous lines in the human language. Now let's quickly talk about how to make failure work in your favor, starting with experiments. Experiments are controlled failure, and they are great. And we literally would not be here without experiments because of evolution. In life form, as in all things, no change is possible without some failures. And evolution is a constant series of works for now solutions. So experimentation, it should similarly be continuous if you want your business, if you want your project, if you want your team to evolve. But in order for that evolution to work, you must accept that failure isn't simply part of the process. It's sometimes the goal. Sometimes you want it to fail, because you can learn a lot from failure but only if we allow failure to happen. So we should start working towards, as our psychological safety, redefining success to learning opportunity, not receiving the outcomes that we expect. But if you do have a failure, they happen. They're wonderful. 
and it blows up your entire lab. You don't want it to take everything else with it. <laughs> so how can you make your failures more survivable, your experiments? Well, start by making them small. There's lots of good reasons to have a small experiment. Number one, remember our brains don't like complexity. Smaller experiments are less complex, and they have fewer variables. Keeping them small also means that actions are very closely situated to the outcomes, so it's easier to establish cause and effect. Know what your success criteria is, what you're looking to learn, and also know what failure looks like, because it's not always the flip side of success. Ask that question, what does failure look like? And do have an exit strategy, because that helps people feel confident that they're not going to be screwed over when this project dies. It's OK to have an experiment that fails, because people will be safe afterward. Now, research does show that the best way to minimize, avoid, and learn from failure is to start talking openly about it and inspecting your failure environment. So what sorts of questions? These are the questions I promised you earlier. What sorts of questions should you be asking of your team, your project, your organization? Take these back to your team. What is the problem that we are trying to solve? And once you figure this answer out, ask each and every team member what they think the answer is. And if you don't get the exact same answer from everyone, you have a communication issue that needs to be sorted out before anything else. Because you need everyone to be on the same page and to be communicating well. Now, I know what I want to get done. But does it actually match what my end user wants to get done in some way? If it doesn't, and this is so common with startups, but if it doesn't, then that's something that you need to work on. Have you listed your assumptions? What are they? Are you even aware that you're making assumptions? That's step one. And that's really power empowering, knowing you're making assumptions. And then list them out. And then check them later. Definitely revisit your assumptions to make sure they haven't been converted to, to knowledge. Have you looked for latent errors? You can do something if you find them, but you can't if you don't even look. Failure is not necessarily the opposite of success. So please, if you know what your problem is and what the solution is, define what failure is. What does failure look like? Is it 50% of success? Is it 85% of success? Is it something completely different? Do you have an exit strategy? What if this goes wrong? What's going to happen to all the tech? What's going to happen to the code? What's going to happen to the people, most importantly? Are you doing postmortems? As you do them, are you just involving the team, or are you bringing in other voices and other ears and other perspectives? Are you only postmorteming those things that go wrong? How does your organization treat failure? And is it a place where you feel psychologically safe even asking these questions at all? Because if the answer is no, I know lots of people who are hiring who can offer you that position. Now, the answers to each one of these 10 questions are going to be different for each project, each organization, each team, which means that the solutions for each team, each organization, they're all going to be different. And that is why there is no silver bullet. And that is why there is no easy way out here. You will have to do the hard work of figuring this stuff out. But I promise you, it will be worth it. These slides are already available here at Internet Archive. There is also that uh, bibliography link that I promised you earlier. And my contact information, I do encourage you to use it. Thank you for listening, and thank you for having me redeploy.